Welcome to the lecture series at the Carlos III University of Madrid that we have called ELAI Project, Ethical Lessons of Artificial Intelligence. This is a, pro a project sponsored by the Tatiana Foundation in its third call for the financing of teaching and cultural projects on leadership and civic humanism. As you know, I am Gonzalo, Gonzalo Genova, professor of the Computer Science and Engineering Department of this university. And this activity, this uh, series of conferences, consists uh, of a series of six conferences developed through the academic year 2023-24 in the four campuses of our university. This series is aimed primarily at students and professors of this university, but it is open to anyone else who wishes to participate, whether they belong to the academic community of another university or to the general public. Each conference will be performed in person and will also be broadcast live and recorded on the university's YouTube channel. Our intention in this project is not to solve the technical problem of machine ethics, but to learn something about human ethics and their rationality by reflecting on the ethics that can and should be applied in the development of computational machines and artificial intelligence. I have my own ideas of this, but for this cycle, I wanted to invite experts from the Spanish and foreign academic world from whom I hope to learn a lot first of all myself. I am pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Michael Ryle, who is an applied mathematician and economist, known for his research in the field of strategic management, especially for his pioneering work on the theory of value capture in business strategy. I knew him when he was at the uh, University of Toronto, but he is currently professor of management at Florida Atlantic University. Since you have a summary of his curriculum on the ELAI project page, I stop here and give him the word for his presentation, which he has entitled Artificial Intelligence and Human Flourishing. Thank Fantastic. you very much. Thank you for that, and thank you for having me. So I'm very excited to be here. I love Madrid. It's one of my favorite places, and, um, and I feel very honored to be here. Um, I'm also, I should, oops. So this is not showing my uh, slides. There we go, okay. So, um, I, by the way, I'm not used to sitting while I give a lecture, so, uh, it, you know, so this feels uh, a little odd to me, but I'm sure it'll be great if you see me wanting to stand up, that's why. Um, so, so this um, lovely graphic is the graphic that Gonzalo asked me to put on the front page. It's a great, very colorful and cute and have AI, teaching and it, it, you know, in a school, it looks really lovely. Um, the graphic that I originally had was this one, uh, which is a little bit darker. <laughs> so, so my views on AI are a little bit darker than, uh, than, than the happy one. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, um, controversy on AI these days. I gave a version of this talk in 2022 and I would say that perhaps my outlook has become even a little bit darker <laughs> since 2022 when I first gave it. Um, and what I'd like to do today, so this is, I, I realize that this is going to be a broad audience, so I'm gonna cover a lot of ground in this talk and it will be at a, at a somewhat superficial level, so I'm not gonna get into any technical details uh, deeply, but what I'm hoping I can do is be a little bit provocative and maybe give you some thoughts that you haven't had yet about. This is a very crowded field now, so if you want money from, uh, from uh, research granting authorities, you know, just put, the, put AI, the letters AI in your grant and you know, you'll be lavished with lots of money. So there are a lot of people in this, there are a lot of people uh, talking about uh, ethics and AI, and so what I'd just like to do is maybe give you maybe a couple of things that haven't been uh, said before. So the way I'd like to proceed is I would like to uh, begin with these two pieces. So AI, how, how am I thinking about that? Um, try to give it a fair uh, summary. 
Uh, then I'd like to talk about what it means to flourish as a human being. So what is the perspective? There are lots of different ways of thinking about that, and I'm going to be talking about one in particular. Uh, and then I'll spend some time, probably the bulk of the talk, talking about what I see as sort of the bad news about AI um, and how it, at least in its present form, is being used and what it may be doing. So, so spoiler alert, you know, my view is that AI is not actually promoting human flourishing at the moment, but the last thing that I would like to do is sort of a shining silver lining on the cloud, which is to say, obviously, AI is just a tool, and there's no reason that it can't be complementing our uh, development as human beings. Before I do, yeah, so at the end, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get back to what we started with, which is the cute, happy AI that helps everyone uh, arrive at, uh, at a utopian state. <laughs> All right, but, we're going, but there's going to be some struggles before we get there. Uh, just a little bit more, uh, very briefly, about my own interests. So I was trained as a game theorist, and uh, that is my primary area in economics, is, uh, is theoretical, uh, is, is game theory. But over time, I've been around for a bit, and over time, my interests have branched into different areas. My interest in game theory is in game theoretic learning. Um, I have uh, my colleague, Jose Penalva, who I went to school with. We went to grad school at UCLA and uh, in the 90s, and that was a time when there was a lot of interest in learning, human learning and economic contexts. And so that's always been an interest of mine, and that eventually brought me into philosophy. So I, I was, uh, started studying a, um, a Toronto philosopher, a Canadian philosopher, who was very active in the, in the 1950s, uh, Bernard Lonergan, and his ideas about insight and how people learn, and I found them really eye-opening, and that led me uh, down the path of, uh, of uh, neo-Aristotelian and Aristotelian philosophy, and that led me to start teaching ethics, business ethics, and I'm happy to say that I have a commentary aimed at business practitioners on the Nicomachean ethics that just got published in December. So that is a, sort of an area of interest, and you'll hear more about that during the talk. And then for you data uh, scientists, I'm also interested in data analytics, and in particular, causal identification uh, in data. And I hosted a couple of uh, conferences, one back in December on uh, machine learning, economics, and uh, causal identification. So as we all know, causation is not the same thing as correlation. Right now, these very sophisticated machine learning algorithms are identifying, in a very sophisticated way, correlations in data. And the next step is to start thinking about helping machines identify causal relations in data. So for example, if you're writing a, uh, an algorithm for a car that's going to be self-driving, Understanding the consequences of the car's actions is very important, so identifying causality is very important. So those are my primary areas of interest. And by the way, I'm very happy for you to interrupt me if you have a question or a concern or a separate point that you'd like to make. Um, don't be shy. Okay, so let me start with the state of play in artificial intelligence. I'll start with sort of the aspiration that we read a lot about in the popular press and then segue into, well, where, where are we really today with this technology? So the popular press wants us uh, to think about computers as eventually um, hitting a pivot point and, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, this, this point at which they begin to write software, their own software and become intelligent and become just like human beings. And you hear a lot about this in the popular press, but you also see a lot of uh, research money going into this area. So there is a lot of work in machine learning and in uh, AI uh, and computer science in general aimed at trying to develop machines that have human-like intelligence. Um, how close are we to that goal right now? Well. AI, uh, artificial intelligence, is basically uh, the pro you know is basically uh, the situation in which a machine receives inputs in some way. Maybe it's input of text. Maybe it's perceptions from uh, sens sensory devices, and its algorithms allow it to solve certain problems and achieve certain goals. That's about as general as, as I can think of stating it. The state of the art 
is very sophisticated pattern recognition. So machines have become insanely good pattern recognizers um, using these multi-layered neural networks and they're being trained on unimaginably large data sets. So sort of these large language models are being trained on sort of everything that was ever written by humans <laughs> is their database. So it turns out that you can, you can do a lot with that. As humans, we're pretty good at this too. So here's a simple IQ test, a uh, question from an IQ test, uh, complete the sequence. So if you look at the sequence of circles, uh, which is the fifth element in the sequence? Any C is correct. So basically the line is moving at a 45 degree angle counterclockwise and C is that. So, so this is in a very simplified sense what chat GPT or the large language models are doing. They're trained on a very large data set and they are predicting the next word in a sentence and they do it unimaginably fast and unimaginably accurately. And it turns out when your data set is everything ever written by human beings, you can do this fairly well. And so yes, we live in the age of AI. Uh, you think about how these technologies touch our lives every day. Uh, of course, we see shopping recommendations, so we buy something or look for something on Amazon, and we see people that bought this also liked uh, some other things, and it lists them. We're now getting customer service chat bots, so it's almost impossible to get a real human being to answer my questions anymore, but there are lots of chat bots that do a fairly bad job of it. Um, but there are other things, too. Um, so, for example, pesticide uh, distribution, so figuring out sort of very efficient ways to apply pesticides to minimize the negative impacts of pesti pesticide use. Obviously, banks care about fraud prevention. We've got MAP. Uh, you know, we all use these maps now. My wife gets furious with me. We just moved, and she's like, I will not let you use the maps, you know, Google Maps, because you need to learn the street names around our house, <laughs> you know. I'm like, oh, no, I don't. I've got this. I never will need to do that again. Um, uh, we're seeing this technology deployed in human resources, job uh, sorting through resumes, uh, interviewing people, and so on. Obviously, medical imaging is a big one. I have a really good friend who is an excellent radiologist, and the one thing that he has advised his kids not to go into is radiology because he is certain that in his lifetime uh, he will not be needed. He will be made obsolete by artificial intelligence. And, you know, that's all about pattern recognition. We have facial recognition. And then, of course, the big ones these days is uh, text to video generation. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then these large language models like ChatGPT. So, so this is very, very powerful tools uh, that do a lot. So let's think about this in terms of the evolution of AI. And we'll start in 2022. So I gave this a version of this talk in 2022. We were all locked down because of COVID in Canada, so this was, uh, I did this online. And sort of the state of the art was this. Um, you know, AI was being used to identify patterns to present things to people that would induce them to buy more stuff, right, or to watch more stuff. So people like you, you know, customers who watch this item also watched, and you get a list of these things. And that was what AI was doing. Uh, pretty much up until that point. Now, this was not infallible. Uh, there were, you know, th this, so we, we see a lot of these things, powerful but easily confused, so the AI can't tell the difference between a puppy and a muffin, um, and we still see these things, right? You need to somehow prove that you're human. Presumably, once AI becomes, has real human-like intelligence, if that day ever comes, then there will be no test like this that the AI can't pass. But right now, it, it has trouble with this. Uh, one of the great um, right. So one of the one of the points that I want to make about this is you could just say, well, the AI just doesn't have sufficient pattern recognition. You know, if you really, really trained it on enough millions of pictures of puppies and muffins, eventually it would get this. And that may be true. Or 
it may be that humans do something that computers don't, namely grasping the essence of a thing, understanding what a dog is, uh, being able to apply the concept of dogs to lots of other things, being able to understand what a muffin is, and we do this very quickly. So one of the areas that's also very hot in uh, computer science is one-shot learning. So something that humans do is you can be walking with your, you know, three-year-old who says, what's that? And you say, that's a dog. And before you know it, you know, everything the child is pointing out, dogs everywhere. Uh, that's one-shot learning, and computers, you know, are not, are not capable of doing that at the moment. Um, and, and perhaps that will always be uh, a problem. So we'll, we'll see. Time will tell. One of the humorous uh, videos that I saw in a response to it was uh, Sony showing their robots having a hard time opening a locked door. So there's, you can, you can Google this, there's video of you know, robot after robot after robot trying to open a door and eventually falling on its back and not being able to move. And uh, some wag said, well, you know, when Skynet attacks, just go in your house and lock the door, <laughs> and you'll be fine. <laughs> okay, so that's 2022. That's 2022. Now, here in, um, in, in 2023, so this is one year ago. This is a video. Hopefully, it'll play. This is a video that went viral last year. Oh. Um, no, it doesn't want to. Um, let's see. There we go. So if you look at this, you know, so this is something oh, that everybody hot. found interesting. That's hot. Uncle but Bill you can clearly see this. that this is generated by Press AI. Of Bell um, <laughs> that. oh, so this hot. is Will Smith. That's and hot. if you look at it, you can see the eyebrows aren't quite Uncle right. Bill, come try this. There are things Fresh disappearing. Fresh pasta of Bell Physics don't seem to be operating properly and so forth. Oh, that's uh, the face isn't that's exactly hot. right. Oftentimes the hands don't quite look right. So, so that's one year ago. That's one year ago. State of the art one year ago. Uh, many of you have probably seen this, but I want to play it for you anyway. This is uh, state of the art now. Uh, this is... Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I think this was released. Uh, this is text to video. So the text was, a confident woman in a black leather coat with a red dress walks confidently uh, down a Tokyo street that is wet and reflecting, and behind her are warm neon lights. So that was the input, and this is the text. Uh, this is the video that came out. Uh, last week, I was uh, talking with some colleagues of mine and uh, one of them had a friend, so I work at a business school, so one of them had a friend who was just about to invest $800 million in a state-of-the-art um, uh, video studio, for movie studio. And he saw this video and said, nope, I'm not, I'm not investing $800 million in a movie studio that would be using real actors. So um, I think we can cross being an x-ray, you know, being an, a radiologist off the list, and we may be able to cross being an actor off the list as well. So you can see this is an insane improvement in the technology in just one year. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, we have all of this disruption being caused by ChatGPT. I'd be curious to know, either as students or as professors, how you're dealing with this. This, this came online in January. I know for myself, uh, and you know, these are all, these are all um, news headlines. You know, ChatGPT is going to be great. ChatGPT is going to be terrible. It's going to cause an education crisis. So it's sort of all over the map. Um, personally, I've gone back to old school. Uh, testing. So I allow my students, it's, it's attention, right? Because as a professor, we have to train students to use the tools that they're going to have in the next phase of their lives, and that's going to be chat GPT for sure and other large language models. On the other hand, I need to assess what they know, not what the chat GPT knows. 
So I give take-home assignments where I encourage the students to use ChatGPT. And it's amazing that I can still rank word of them fairly clearly, even though they're all using the same technology in terms of getting at the right ideas. So there's clearly some human uh, input that's still required there. And then at exam time, it's a piece of paper that you write on in longhand, you know, while I'm watching you and there are no digital devices. So that's, that's kind of where we are. Um, okay, so yes, this is amazing progress. Um, will machines acquire uh, human-like intelligence? I don't know. Uh, if you are a materialist philosophically, if you believe that what humans do all comes from their brain, the physical matter of their body, then your answer pretty much has to be yes, I think. Um, you know, at some point, if everything we do is a function of a material brain, then, you know, why not? And especially once the computers begin to program themselves, then it should be even easier. Um, for those who believe that there's some immaterial component to the human mind, and I would count myself in this camp mainly because I'm convinced that the human, there are certain human capabilities that seem very hard to explain as coming from uh, a material basis, like abstract conceptualizing, and we'll talk more about that. Then you say, well, no, a computer is never going to have the life that a human has. So I want to be clear that if what we're doing is measuring human-like behavior, behavior that uh, is output from a human mind, then I think we may have computers that are indistinguishable from humans in any way, or humans that at least can pass any kind of test that we can observe. Um, but passing an intelligence test is not the same thing as having an inner life. So I don't believe that my thermostat is ever going to have anxiety over the fact that it was created as a thermostat and not a uh, laptop PC or something like that. So but we'll talk more about that in a second. So, but I'm not really, the point of it, uh, the point here is that whatever you may believe, that's not what I'm talking about today. <laughs> okay, so I'm not here to convince you one way or the other. I'm just being honest about my own beliefs. You may have different beliefs, and that's all fine. I don't know the answer, and it's an argument, a philosophical argument that I'm not, um, that I'm not here to engage in. What I want, the, the discussion that I want to have today is given present technology, not the technology at some far off date when we have lifelike hum, uh, machines, but given the technology today, is AI complementing our ability to live, uh, complementing our well-being, complementing our ability to flourish, complementing our lives as human beings? And I'm willing to take it to the, you know, look into the future into in-kind refinement. So what computers do now is very sophisticated pattern recognition. And it's amazing. And it's powerful. Um, given even further refinements in this kind of pattern recognition technology, right, which we can imagine. So we can imagine that I can write a whole movie uh, starring, uh, you know, a indistinct stars that are indistinguishable from Tom Cruise or whoever else I want to put in there. I put in the text or I send it a script and boom, I've got the movie and it looks fantastic. Um, sure, I think that's, that's going to happen and we can think about those things. So given what we see today, and given the present technology, and not worrying about this other question that isn't going to be answered for a while anyway, uh, if ever, um, how is this technology impacting us? And is it good for us? So to answer that question, I want to pivot now to, well, what do we think is good for humans? What does it mean to flourish as a human being? And I'm going to argue that actually the classical ideas, going back to Aristotle and going forward, and modern uh, scientific research seem to have converged in terms of what it means to live a happy life. So what do I mean by that? Let's go into it. So what is the essence of being human? So if we think all the way back to the classical Greeks and Aristotle in particular, uh, they notice that, well, we are animals, and so we flourish in the same ways that animals do. We need to nourish ourselves, we need to reproduce so that we 
uh, expand the race and we need to keep well and avoid getting hurt and all of those things that animals do. But in addition, we seem to have this conceptualization power that animals don't appear to have. Uh, we have the ability to think about things like the good, the true, and the beautiful, which are abstract concepts. So while it may be the case that pattern recognition, which by the way leads to imagination, so in the classical sense, uh, even the Greeks would say, well, animals had uh, imaginations. And we've seen now that pattern recognition, and what I just discussed, is a very powerful capacity. Um, the ancient Greeks would say, well, yes, but we have this thing that seems to be immaterial. So I may be able to argue that, well, I see a circle and I can have an image of a circle that's stored in my brain. Maybe my electrons are arranged a certain way and I can put that in memory and recall it from memory. But it's not so clear where the concept of circularity is stored in my brain. That is a universal concept that allows me to see any instance of a circle and identify it as such. So, and then when you get to think that's circularity, which at least has a grounding in the physical, but when we start thinking about really abstract concepts like the good or the beautiful, it's not so clear uh, where that would be connected to a brain. And in any event, it doesn't seem that animals think this way. It doesn't seem that animals, to the best of our knowledge, and, and I've studied a lot of the animal research and so forth, it doesn't seem that animals um, exhibit this uh, capacity. Now, maybe they will one day, or maybe there's a species we haven't discovered, or maybe there are others out in the universe that have developed this capacity. But at the moment, when we talk about being a fully functional human being, banging on all cylinders, as we say, a human being that is just living the, the human life, um, this conceptualization capacity is a fairly high level one and therefore one that we probably want to perfect or at least perfect to the best of our ability. What does that mean? Well, that means that wisdom is a very high level human capacity and in particular, knowing what is good. So if we want to be healthy and have well-being and flourish, then we need the wisdom to know what are the things I need to do in order to make that happen. So wisdom is knowing what is truly good uh, or at least that is one of the aspects of wisdom. Prudence, another cognitive capacity, means knowing how to implement the good. So I'm in a particular situation. I think, well, what would be good, the good choice for me? I'm able to think about good choices. Notice that free will depends on the ability to conceptualize the good. If I have no concept of the good, then I can't have free will. In order to have free will, I need to rank order my choices and think about what's good for me and then select the thing that I think is good for me. So if you believe in free will, then you need to have this capacity. Um, and so I need to know what's good, and in order to be fully functioning, I need to know how to achieve the good. I need to know what acts allow me to be uh, better off. And then there's one more piece that's pretty important. I need to wanna do it, <laughs> right? So if I see a piece of pie uh, sitting on the uh, counter, and I say, wow, that's a nice piece of pie. Um, I think I'll just eat it. Uh, I know it's not good for me. I know I shouldn't do it, but I don't have the commitment to do what is right. Then I'm not going to get there. So I need to have wisdom. I need to have prudence. And I need to have the desire to do what's good. So all of these things need to line up. And of course, they're not um, easy. Getting there is not easy, as any of us who have struggled with, uh, I think I've gone through, I don't know how many pieces of exercise equipment, because I know, well, the rowing machine will be great, because I'll buy one of those, it'll be in my house, and then I can just go to the exercise room and do the rowing, and I'll get the exercise, and it'll be good. And then after the rowing machine is sat in that room unused for a couple of years, I think, I know what it is, it's the elliptical trainer. In fact, the elliptical trainer with the movie, you know, with the TV screen in front of it, that'll be the thing, you know. And so this is just not easy to do. Doing these things uh, are, are simply uh, not, not easy for us. Okay, so the classical notion of human flourishing was deductive. In other words, they thought 
in the following way. If you want to attain your full human potential, then you probably need to be the best instance of the kind of thing you are. So you need to maximize your essential features. You need to live up to the essential features that make you a human. If that's wisdom, prudence, and desire, then those are the things that logically you should master in order to achieve a deep sense of satisfaction and fulfillment. And where we eventually end up is uh, loving others as an implication of human flourishing. Now that's not the emotion, right? This is the Greek word agape, which is willing the good of others for their sake. So there's really no, no emotion involved in this. This is a, a deductive uh, process in which I think, well, and this is why we can say, well, you know, you should love your enemies. You think, well, love my enemies? I mean, I thought about that for a long time. Am I supposed to hug them? Or, you know, we all sing a song together. And no, what it means is that I should will their good. Now, this is a human, extremely difficult human uh, for us to achieve because it means, first of all, I need to achieve it for myself and be really banging on all cylinders as a human being as myself, which is hard enough as it is, and then it's even harder for me to live in someone else's shoes, and as a game theorist, we think about this all the time, right? We think, well, in order to play a game, I need to put myself in the other guy's shoes and think about how is he going to respond to me, and how does he think I'm going to respond to him, and how does he think I think he thinks I'm going to respond to him, and so forth. So this exercise is very difficult, putting yourself in someone else's shoes and then trying to do what is good for them. If you can do that, you've attained this sort of super high level of human capacity uh, using all of, our, uh, all of our cognitive skills. So this is where classical thinking um, eventually takes us. And as I say, it's a deductive exercise. Okay, however, The, the um, field of psychology, uh, Seligman, you may know him, so he's the guy that started positive psychology. And I don't know if you read any of his work, but basically he said, you know, this is back in the, in the 70s and 80s, he was a PhD student, he said, you know, we're getting okay at tamping down the, um, the symptoms of uh, severe mental disorders but that seems like kind of a low bar, you know? So people with these severe psychiatric problems, we can give them a pill and it seems to calm them down a little bit. Um, that seems like a really low bar. As psychologists, shouldn't we be trying to find ways to make people happier? I mean, we should aim high, you know? We should be able to make people happy. And so um, he gets a grant and they start looking into all um, wisdom and religious traditions in history and in the world. Huge, huge survey. They're thinking, and of course psychology is a very empirical and inductive science. So their thinking is this. Societies eventually grope their way forward and figure out what makes people happy. So let's look at what um, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, um, Bushido, Everything we can think of, what are the life lessons that these uh, traditions say will make people happy? And they find in the intersection of everything are six virtues. And guess what they are? Wisdom, temperance, courage, justice, willing the good of others, and transcendence, feeling that you're part of something larger than yourself. So they come at it. Inductively, you know, Aristotle came at it. Deductively, they pretty much wind up in the same place. So developing these character qualities seem to be important if we're going to lead deeply fulfilling lives. But as I say, this is very challenging. Uh, we know that sentient animals are driven by their instincts and we know that we as animals also have instincts or as, as uh, you know, if you're a Thomist, you would say passions or emotions or our instinctive drives. Very, very powerful. But we also have this capacity to choose things and think about things and try to change our behavior 
so that we eventually learn what's truly good, right? What's truly good for our well-being, develop a capacity to, to think about how to implement those things successfully, and to align our desires with what we know is good. We aren't born this way. We may be born with these basic instincts, but we're not born instantly with wisdom and having all of our desires in the right place and so on. We also know that we're social animals, so social institutions and our relationships and friendships are very important to this. So we can think of it in this way. Uh, most of us are sort of in the controlled versus uncontrolled area, meaning we know what's good for us, but I don't do the exercising when I know I should. And that's, that's uncontrolled, right? There I'm not exer ex exerting self-discipline. But sometimes we exert self-discipline. Sometimes I say, you know, I spent a lot of money on that elliptical machine and I'm really getting fat. I need to go uh, do it, even though I don't want to. Um, virtue is when you not only know what's good for you and you not only know how to do what's good for you, but you also want to do it. You can commit to it. Then it becomes, in some sense, easy for you. That's what virtue is. So if someone says, well, I'm very virtuous. I really wanted that apple pie but I didn't take it, then you would say, no, you're not virtuous. <laughs> you know, virtue is saying, no, I didn't even want it. I know what's good for me and, I, and my desires are properly aligned. Now, viciousness, and we'll talk more about this in a second, the vicious character is a real problem because the vicious character not only doesn't know what's good for them, but they think that what they're doing and their desires are aligned with that. So, they're, uh, so this is very hard to break out of. Not only do I think the apple pie looks delicious, but I think it would be the healthiest, best thing in the world for me to eat as much pie as possible. That's the vicious behavior. So like I say, most of us are, are struggling. You know, most of us are struggling here and trying, trying to move a little bit more to the right. Okay, so this is hard. And so you would think, well, gosh, we have this AI. It's fantastic. You know, is it helping us on this road to realizing our full potential as human beings? And uh, as I said, uh, I think at the moment the answer is no, for understandable reasons, but I think at the moment the, uh, the answer is no, and, and I'm going to give you some reasons why. So I'm going to talk about three ways that uh, AI undermines our ability to realize our full potential as human beings. One is what I'll refer to as vicious cycles, which is a self-confirmation problem. The other is being manipulated. Um, so this is often goes by the, by the name nudging. There's a very large literature on nudging. I'll talk more about that. And then there's just coercion, uh, using AI to repress or oppress people. And there I'll talk a little bit about social credit scoring. So there are new dimensions uh, to these. These features have always been present, but there are new sort of uh, dangers given the c capability that I, AI presents. So let me see if I can uh, convince you that, that these things are a concern. So remember, I'm not, uh, I'm not arguing that AI is inherently bad or that, they're, that AI doesn't have great potential to bring happiness to people. I'm just arguing that we have some problems with it right now that I think are, are an issue. So the first idea is self-confirming equilibrium. So what is that? This is something that my colleague uh, Jose and I have written on. Uh, there's a, there's a well-known paper in Game Theory by Kalai and Lair in 1993. And this is sort of the canonical example. So the canonical example is imagine that you're in some ancient uh, seafaring uh, society that, that, uh, that earns its keep by, by doing a lot of fishing. And the belief is that the world is flat. Okay. So if the world is flat, then how do you optimize, subjectively optimize, if you believe this, how do you optimize if you're a fisherman? Well, you stay close to the shore. You don't go sailing off into the horizon or you sail off the, uh, off the um, edge of the earth, you believe. So your belief causes you to take certain actions and you stay close to the shore, you catch your fish and you have a safe arrival. Great, your initial belief is unperturbed, right? You do not see counterfactual information. Now, this is important because it, it's rational 
for you to believe this. So you want to be careful. You're, you're not believing the right thing. So we all know the world is not flat. And, and we know that even ancients believed the world wasn't flat either. But we're just, this is just a made-up example. But the point is, is that your belief and the actions that you take are rational, given your beliefs. It's just that the consequences generated by your actions do not perturb your beliefs. So you're in a loop. You're stuck in a loop. And in fact, if you're a Bayesian, your beliefs strengthen. With each time you observe that nothing happens, you're, you, you know, your beliefs strengthen, and you believe you've really, really got it right. Well, this is what AI started doing. If you think back on the example of people like you, you know, enjoyed something like this, or the types of things that people were reading. So what happens is, is I come to AI, I sit down at my computer with some initial beliefs, some preferences, I start reading things, and the AI is, the AI is watching what I click, watching what I click, watching what I click, and I tend to go to things that I like. So AI starts feeding me things that I like, so I click more. The AI's goal is to have me click on a lot of things. In a way, it doesn't really care what I click on as long as I click on things and more advertisements are sold. You can see the problem here is that in terms of wisdom building, I'm getting stuck in a loop. I'm not really gaining wisdom. I'm just reinforcing the beliefs I have. So wisdom gets stuck, basically. There's a great uh, movie on this Right? Wisdom gets stuck. There's a great movie, if you haven't seen it, called The Social Dilemma. Terrific movie, I think, Gonzalo, you saw it. And uh, it's, a, um, it's, it's a movie where we go in and talk to the actual developers of AI, very famous people. And, and we see sort of across the board these guys, these tech bros, you know, these super wealthy people saying, we didn't realize what a problem this would be. It's totally short-circuiting what people do. They ask them, you know, well, would you let your kids have a digital phone? And they're like, no, we don't allow digital phones <laughs> in our house. So these are, these are the people that invented the technology, right? They're like, no, my kids aren't going on that stuff. Oh, my God. This is a great, uh, a great movie, and it shows, um, it shows this uh, realization that the developers begin to have of this self-confirming, they, they don't refer to it as self-confirming equilibrium, but that's what it is. It's this reinforce, reinforcement loop. And they're bothered by it. Why are they bothered by it? Well, they discover it. They realize that there's money to be made. They've got a technology that trains people, that can induce people to, uh, to reinforce their beliefs, but as we see in the movie, they're bothered because people are developing the wrong beliefs. If there's someone who doesn't believe in climate change, they're reading a lot of stuff that refutes climate change, uh, you know, or racist material, or uh, you know, what, whatever you know, whatever things the people in Silicon Valley think are bad beliefs. So the people in Silicon Valley go, whoa, we're creating a monster because there are all these people out there with bad, you know, there are people that voted for Trump. Half the country voted for Trump, you know. We've got to do something to break the disinformation where disinformation, of course, is defined as things they don't like, right? And they never think, well, maybe we're the ones in the loop, right? So, so it isn't, I'm not the one with the self-confirming beliefs. It's all those other people that don't believe what I believe. And so what they start doing is nudging. And nudges is building the technology explicitly to cause people to alter their beliefs and behavior unbeknownst to them. So that's what nudging is. So um, Thaler and Sunstein in 2008 introduced the idea of what they call libertarian paternalism, which is a frightening phrase in my view, but uh, they seem to like it. And uh, they introduced this idea of nudging. And the idea of nudging is changing the choice architecture. So when someone's faced with a decision, you rearrange the decision or do something so that people have the um, sort of cha their behavior is changed in a way that, that ostensibly helps them become better. 
The early uh, applications of this were things like this. This seems like a fairly har harmless example. So, um, you know, if you've ever walked into a men's room with urinals, you know, there's the, the floor is always a mess. And they thought, well, look, we just put a fly in the middle of the urinal. And sure enough, you know, <laughs> I start pointing at the fly, and this leads to less of a mess. So little things like that are, you know, you don't really think that someone's manipulating your behavior, but, but they are, and, and maybe in this, you know, very useful uh, way of doing it. Um, but, but the less sort of um, harmless thing that begins to happen is social engineering. And in this case, the, the people designing the software are actually designing software that they want you to change your beliefs and behave in a way that they uh, dictate is good. And, um, you know, the implication for wisdom should be clear. If, if uh, self-confirming equilibrium is a, is a halter on, on wisdom, then this is even worse. Now, right, because you're not only undermining wisdom, but you're also causing people to react emotionally. So one of the ways that you manipulate people's behavior and amplify their beliefs is to get them angry or to get them, uh, you know, upset, fearful, right? So if you can induce emotion, that's going to lead people to react. And that's a very strong way of, of causing people to change what they're doing. And the problem with that is that this, this is going exactly in the opposite direction. Okay, all sentient animals, all sentient animals react to their instinctive, uh, uh, to their instinctive um, components of their, of their mind, their, you know, if you, their emotions, if you will. The whole idea of being human is that we have a rational side that helps us control and find the right balance between these things. And so if you're preventing me from seeing information and you're playing me, trying to make me scared, then, um, then, you're, then you're pushing me in, 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 the, wrong, you know, in the wrong direction. Um, so promote fear is, is a common one. Uh, you know, climate change is going to kill everyone. Uh, the pandemic is going to kill everyone. Um, the dissident uh, populists in your country are a bunch of Nazis who are going to kill everyone. <laughs> All of a sudden, everyone's terrified of everything. And then you start manipulating the information that people see. This is a very effective way of behavior control. So when I did this paper for the first time, uh, present, made this presentation, um, I was interested in COVID because I had been locked down in Canada for two years. So an entire country was put under house arrest effe effectively for two years uh, under the sort of a, a essential narrative that the pandemic was an existential threat to society that the experimental mRNA therapies were safe, that the experimental mRNA therapies were effective, and there was a lot of um, narrative that unvaccinated people were a huge risk to others. Now, I'm not going to take a position on that. Those things may or may not be true, but what was catching my attention was what was being allowed to be said in the media. So I started looking into it, and back then you could. So I, I looked at the Pfizer trial documentation. The Pfizer trial documentation taken as they wrote it. So now there are even questions about the, the Pfizer trial, but back then just taking what they said, um, if you were unvaccinated in their, um, in their uh, um, trial group, you had a .0088 chance of contracting COVID. Um, by their measure, if you were vaccinated, that went down to a 0.0004% chance of catching COVID. And that's where the 95% risk reduction number came from. Going from 0.0088 to 0.0004 is in fact a 95% reduction. So that's an honest statistic, but you know, as I, as I point out here, I've, I've done the calculation, the probability if you were a US soldier storming Omaha Beach on July 6, 1944, the chances of you being killed was about 6%. It was, it was a slaughter. 
But those people voluntarily did that because they thought they were fighting not only for their freedom, but for the freedom of others in their homeland. They, they wanted to live in a world where people didn't tell them what medicines they had to take. <laughs> you know, that's what they were fighting against. And, you know, one has to wonder that if we're aware of these probabilities, you know, would the country of Canada have unanimously, happily gone into a state of lockdown for two years, had their kids' uh, educations damaged uh, since in a significant way, for a 1% chance of not catching COVID. By the way, that's not a 1% chance of dying. The 6% here is the probability of getting killed on Omaha Beach. This is the chances of uh, you know, getting, catching COVID. So this, this concerned me. Why are we not seeing this information? Um, also, at that time, 95% people who died from COVID, COVID had some co comorbidity. So were they dying from COVID or were they dying from something else? Um, I use the uh, Canadian uh, health database to compute that the average age of people who died from COVID was 86. The life expectancy, the natural life expectancy in Canada was 84. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, these people uh, were, were dying uh, on average older than they were expected to even live. And hospital rates were about 2%, which was very comparable to the flu. There are arguments, and again, I'm just going to where I was in 2022, that these were safe. But if you looked at the VAERS database, there were um, deaths from the vaccines were about 15,000, which were greater than the sum total of all deaths computed over 30 years um, from all other vaccines. So this seemed that there's some data here that suggests maybe these things need to be thought about a little bit more carefully. And I, I've gone until 5.30, correct? Until I've got another half hour. Um, and then there was uh, this question about infection and transmission, and it looks like you are more likely, from the data that we knew at that time, you're more likely to get COVID if you were vaccinated than if you weren't vaccinated. So what concerned me was not whether or not the official narrative was true. It may very well be true. This is still people debating this today. I'm not really trying to take a position on it. Um, I may have signaled my own, my own position, but, but the position isn't really important. What's important was that none of this information was allowed on uh, social media. So Twitter, Facebook, Google, all put a very heavy thumb on censoring this information from people. And this just seems like information that wise people who are trying to develop wisdom should have available to them. That's, that's the point that I'm trying to make. People didn't know this. I presented this stuff and people were shocked. Um, and they shouldn't have been. This was information that should have been discussed, debated, and uh, thought carefully about. Now, for a more recent um, example of the AI behaving badly, um, this caused quite a, a storm in 2018, where Google AI listed Nazism as the ideology of the California Republican Party, okay? So, oh, there was a lot of outrage about this. And, uh, of course, um, and, and, and for good reason, because if you start calling your political opponents Nazis, well, what do you do with Nazis? I mean, you know, if you have a chance to stop Nazis, we all know what to do there. Um, harsh measures, you know. But immediately, places like Wired and other places said, well, this was just a mistake. Um, there was a Wikipedia, someone vandalized Wikipedia. The, um, Google search engine picked it up and, you know, and it made a mistake and there's no intentional manipulation of the technology. Then last week we had this fiasco in which uh, Google launched its uh, image generator. So the images on the left was uh, in response to a question about, you know, please show me images of 17th, famous 17th century philosophers. The image on the right is, please show me images of Romans. And there are people doing everything they could think of to get this thing to generate an image of a white male to no, uh, you know, to, to, to no success. Uh, yet, if you asked the 
image generator to give you images of um, Zulu warriors, it had no problem doing that accurately. Now, this is kind of funny, and, you know, there was a big people complaining about this, and Google said, oh, you know, we're very embarrassed and we need to uh, fix it. But what this suggests, this is not an accident. This is not happening because the engine was trained on, you know, faulty Wikipedia pages. This is something that has been engineered into the technology. And that's the concern, right? We can joke about it. Here's, here's I thought this was a good joke, <laughs> you know, so this, this came out after, uh, <laughs> after, uh, after this fiasco. Um, but this is a problem, and in fact, there, is now, there are now people doing scholarly research. So, for example, uh, there's a paper, 2024, just got released, and I think this is a very interesting paper, I would encourage you to read it, um, in which the authors look into uh, bias in ChatGPT. And they find, uh, I think fairly convincingly, convincingly that ChatGPT systematically uh, biases its chats favorably towards Democrats in the United States, Lula in Brazil, and the Labor Party in the UK. Now again, my concern is if we're caring about human flourishing, and by the way, we're, we're hearing the tech bros going, this is fantastic technology because you're going to have AI teachers. Remember the diagram in the first slide? They're going to teach your kids. It's going to be great. It's going to adapt to your kids and really be effective in teaching your kids. And you have to say, well, you know, maybe it'll be great or maybe not so great. It depends on whether or not people are intentionally building their point of view into the technology. So this is nudging, right? Now, the, you know, this is not nudging. This is why this, this is a fail, because people were aware of it. Nudging only works when people aren't really aware of what's going on. Then we have just outright use of technology to oppress people. And uh, China is well down the road on developing social credit scoring system. Uh, I think that there are many people in our own society uh, that would love to have this level of behavior control on society. Um, what the social credit scoring is, is keeping a monitoring everything people do. So we all know that your phone is basically a spy device that lets you talk to other people, <laughs> you know, that happens to let you talk or gives you maps. But uh, it's, it's recording everything you do. Everything you do is being recorded. And, uh, and the Chinese now have said, well, we're going to use that. We're going to use our cameras. And uh, we're going to give all of our citizens, each citizen will have a social credit score to see how good they are doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the behaviors that we want them to have. And um, once, once you've got that, well, then you can you can turn things on and off for certain individuals. Maybe you don't get a promotion. Maybe you don't get this job. Maybe your kids don't get to go to school. Maybe you don't get to travel, right? So once you've got this thing on your phone, the government can control. And once you have the social credit score, the government can uh, control what you're doing and what you have access to. The, um, not to dog too much on, on our response to the, to the pandemic, although I do think that the pandemic will go down as one of the worst uh, public policy disasters, you know, our reaction to it in the history of Western civilization. But these, um, you know, these, uh, these phones with your passport, your vaccine passport, that is a social credit scoring system. That's what it is. It, there's only one dimension, have you been vaccinated? The government wants you vaccinated, yes or no. And then we turn things on and off that you can do or not do. Once everybody accepts that, then we say, well, you know, there's vaccines, there's also who you voted for, who you're giving your charitable money to. You know, we're going to collect a lot of behaviors and put them on your phone and decide what you, what you want. In China, they've developed AI prosecutors. So there's a scary, <laughs> there's a scary notion, right? Um, you know, and they're often embracing these things. Of course, the Chinese already know the answer of whether you're guilty or not <laughs> when you've been picked up. And uh, they've graduated to the vans. So they now have the uh, execution vans. They're the efficient way of driving around. It's no longer having to pick you up and take you somewhere and put you in a field and, you know, and execute you. Now they just put you in the van and that's that. 
Um, in Canada, of course, they were using AI to track everybody all the time where we were going. So we were told not to travel. We are not allowed out of our houses. And they were monitoring whether or not you were leaving your house. Uh, that meant monitoring where everybody was going. And then we have, on top of all of that, this quote, quote unquote, private, public private pr partnerships. So we know from Matt Taibbi's Twitter files, and by the way, I've got links to all this stuff in the talk, so I hope you'll post the slides and, and people can look at this. And we see that the US government was deeply involved in um, controlling Facebook, Google, and Twitter in terms of what they were uh, censoring and not censoring. They were um, booting people off Twitter, they were uh, shadow banning them and so forth, and we have we have the emails and, and uh, Taibi published them. And if you look, something that's really almost uh, very eye-opening, the number of security state people working at tech companies is astounding. So there was recently, I'm just picking up recent stuff. I mean, we could talk for hours and hours on this stuff, but uh, uh, there's an article linked to here that uh, demonstrates that almost every department at Google has an ex-CIA person working there. And, you know, that maybe there's perfectly good reasons for that. Um, but we do know from the Twitter files, we do know that the government has been heavily involved in telling the tech companies who has the right speech and who doesn't and censoring people and not at the direction of the government. So these are all... Um, seem like they're bad uh, if you believe in human flourishing in the way that I've discussed that you know people should exercise their wisdom they should learn from succeeding and failing to develop prudence and wisdom and to train their own desires so that they can really use all of their human faculties and all of these things seem to be working against that that's the concern that I'm presenting today and you might say well yeah but you know still if everybody's getting happier you know who cares and I think we all feel like things are just not very good in a way that, that we haven't seen uh, in a long time. Uh, people are becoming more narcissistic. Um, this, this one came two weeks ago that I found astounding. There was a guy that runs a porn site who thought, well, you know, there's a natural extension for my porn site is AI porn. So I'm going to get into that. And this guy who's a porn, you know, porn site guy says that he's horrified by the requests that are coming into the AI. That's concerning, right? And that's moving us, again, towards our baser instincts rather than you know, um, trying to control our, uh, our passions. I know as a professor, there's no question over 30 years, my students have very short attention spans, uh, have a very hard time. I, I'm now down, if I show a video in class, it's a minute and a half. That, that's about the attention span that my students have. Um, not all students, and I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to smear everyone with a broad brush, but you really notice these things. Um, pe what people know, one in five Americans believe the Holocaust is a myth. One in five, that's 20 percent. Don't believe this happened. How, how can that be? Well, one of the ways it can be is the way AI is controlling people's information. And of course, we see the fall off effects of that. People don't trust the media, so we're not stupid. You know, we know that, that we're seeing things that we're told something for two years and then all of a sudden something else happens that disproves everything that we've been told. And this is happening again and again. So now people don't trust the media, but who can I trust? We don't trust government. You're seeing these populist movements arising throughout Europe and the United States. Um, Suicide rates are increasing among men and women in teenagers, so, so adolescent suicide rates have doubled over the last 10 years. In the United States last year, we had 100,000 deaths from drug overdoses. The war in Vietnam, 50,000 people died over the cor course of at least five years. So we now have the, the effect, the equivalent of two Vietnams happening per year in the United States. And in the United States, where I live, and I can tell you this is very much a thing, um, most people believe that we are presently in a cold civil war. People will not marry uh, people that have different political beliefs than, than they have. And half the people surveyed believe that that will go into a kinetic war sometime in the near future. All right. 
So I think we all, my guess is we all kind of feel like, yeah, we're living in times that don't seem very good, and it does seem that that is true. And I don't think that AI is the cause of all of this, but I do think it's a contributing factor. I do think that we've gotten off offline. Um, so, so that's that's the bad news. So that's that's my dark, uh, <laughs> that's my dark view. Um, but I am an optimist, believe it or not. So I do think that we know that uh, AI is a tool, um, and it does improve. Um, our well-being in many, many ways. So I don't want to suggest that that isn't happening. Uh, there are drugs that are being developed, and you know there are all kinds of things that uh, I, I use ChatGPT. I'll sh I'll show you an example in a second. So these technologies are there. I think they can help us flourish as human as human beings. Um, but you know we don't seem to be going in that direction at the moment uh, but I do believe it can be and in fact I have a paper with Ralph Hertwig he's uh, he's at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin uh, we published this in 2019 about nudge nudging and his uh, his whole field is about not nudging people not trying to trick people into behavior but by teaching them ways to learn and so there's a very large field in psychology that sort of goes against this nudge dynamics um, one famous example that I'll share with you is that people are very bad at computing probabilities. So this is something that we are traditionally very, very bad at. And so one way you can do that is nudge people into doing what you think they want to do. But um, Hertwig and his colleagues have found that there are learning heuristics that people can use that are fairly simple that actually allow them to get probabilities fairly well. And so that would be an example of a way of complementing human nature and helping us get sort of to a good point. The other thing, I think this is a lot bigger than people realize right now. So this is, I'm gonna put a, a, a flag in the ground here, and you can't re read what that is, but I'll explain it to you, and, that, and then we'll be done. Um, AI democratizes AI. So up until now, you have required, and, and even now, but I think this is gonna change very soon. You have needed a huge lab of software engineers to design your AI and use your AI. And if you're one of the people that wants to control others, then you know, you've got hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, you're spending on people doing research and developing the software and so forth. But there's something very democratizing in this technology. And what you see on the screen uh, is I had a talk, so this now, I had a talk on causal inference at a, uh, at, a, at a conference. And I wanted to do a simulation that would be, have a causal relationship uh, between a certain number of variables, run a simulation, generate the data points, do the traditional regression analysis on that data, report on it, and then talk more about how to do causal inference and some other methods that I had. So, so at the time I thought, well, I'd like to do a simulation. I don't know how to do a simulation. Um, I guess I should, you know, that would be a, something written in Python. I've heard about Python. I don't know anything about Python. So I went to ChatGPT and I said, um, I need to write a simulation in Python. It should have three variables, x, y, and z. Y is the dependent variable. X should be independent and normally distributed with mean zero and variance one. Z should be a function of x as follows, and it's a linear function where E is an error term that is mean zero and normally distributed. I want to run a simulation for 100 points, one. Two, run a, a standard re regression of Y on Z. Three, print the standard regression statistics. And four, create a chart I can put into my presentation. Um, so it may have taken me five minutes to write that paragraph. The program that was produced is on the left. And the results are on the right. So that's the graph. I just cut and pasted that into my, my presentation along with the standard regression statistics. That's from someone who knows absolutely nothing about Python. So in five minutes, I had a Python program that was doing what I wanted that is not unsophisticated. So if I had to learn that on my own, I can tell you it would have easily taken a week. I mean, I have programmed some things before, but I knew nothing about Python, nothing about the commands, nothing about the Python library. I would have spent days 
trying to figure out how to do this. And in the end, I just wouldn't have done it, right? I'm not going to spend that much time on one slide for a presentation. I'm just too busy for that. So here's a case where the AI helped me, uh, and not only helped me, it helped me communicate some important ideas to my audience that they would not have had communicated, in my view, as effectively. So in that way, we've got this sort of virtuous cycle starting to happen, where I'm being made more efficient to think about things and not spend a lot of time writing Python code that I don't need to know and I don't want to do. I need to be thinking about communicating ideas, which I was able to do. Hopefully, I communicated those ideas in a, in a better way and the audience walked away with a piece of information that they didn't have before. Now my point again, the, the reason that I show you this is this took me five minutes. This suggests to me the power of this um, technology may be that we all become programmers, that we are all able, it isn't just Google, uh, that, that the people who are worried about misinformation in the true sense of misinformation, people who are worried about being nudged, People who think, I need a variety of views in order to be sure that mine are solid. It's kind of an old-fashioned view now, but, but you know, people who believe that will be able to develop the tools that can help them. They are not going to be monopolized. In, I don't think they're going to be monopolized by the Googles and Facebooks of the world. I think we're coming into a time when we'll see a lot more of this in a much more decentralized way. So that's a prediction. You know, we'll see if that's true. But uh, hopefully we end back up where we started with the happy, uh, the happy robot and uh, the AI doing good and helping us flourish. That's it. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> it's time for questions. Sebastian has the micro for whoever wants to pose a question. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I found it very, very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, because I mean, we know that AI is not perfect and probably never be. So um, I think that maybe the question is if it's more or less biased than a human, and if you consider that being less biased than a human is good enough, for instance, for AI or kids. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so the first answer is we know that in some applications, AI is much less biased than humans. Um, there have been tests done, for example, in radiology, uh, careful, careful tests, that show that uh, AI does a much better job of uh, consistently identifying problems in um, x-rays than humans. So, and in fact, the study that I saw, they gave a bunch of radiologists a bunch of x-rays, asked them to do the diagnoses, went away from several months, came back, asked them to do the diagnoses again, and there was a huge number of changed diagnoses, right? So if you're human and someone, you know, cuts you off in traffic or you've had a fight with your, with your uh, spouse or whatever, you may not be doing the best job. So, so AI has the potential to do that, which is the bright side of AI. Um, but the things that I've been talking about are aspects of AI that I think are problematic. So AI um, that, that just passively allows you to feed yourself information that you like so that you never see more than what you want to see, that's not biased. The AI isn't really doing anything biased. The AI is just operating. You're the one that's biased, and you're the one that's increasing your bias, so that's bad. Um, but if AI is being used to attempt to bias you in a particular direction, which is what I spent most of my time talking about it, then I think that's bad. And so I think that you know, if you're a powerful entity, whether you're a person, in power or a government in power, you tend to want to keep power. The idea that you can control behavior in society, I think, is a very attractive one. And so given the power of these tools, I don't think it's surprising that people would like to use them for purposes 
that again, in my view, whether they're even good or bad, maybe they're doing great things, but again, humans need to flourish. That I believe strongly. And, and things that retard that development, I, I, I think is problematic. So I think the AI should be helping us realize our full potential as opposed to retard it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank okay. you. Yeah. I mean, that had to be a little bit controversial, wasn't it? <laughs> you must have some objections or questions. <clears throat> Um, okay, Michael, so thank you very much for your conference. I think it has been, in a sense, uh, oh, okay, so, yeah, so yeah. I, think, uh, I think it has been, in a, in a certain sense, uh, very democratic, you know, because uh, you have touched upon many different areas, you know, which uh, has been wonderful, you know, to illustrate your points. Uh, so, first of all, I have a question for you. So, you know, so uh, most of us, you know, the newcomers to the field of computer science in general and artificial intelligence in particular, you know, for, for most of us, uh, chat GPT, you know, has really been the revelation and the main impulse. Uh, but, you know, for those like you who uh, have been longer in the field, so I just would like to, for you to reflect uh, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, on your prior to chat, uh, chat uh, GPT experience, you know, on how you uh, perceived the field of uh, computer science and the subfield of artificial intelligence, uh, you know, before uh, the explosion of, uh, of uh, chat GPT. And then just, uh, I will be very brief, you know, you, uh, at some point of the session, you left an open-ended question, you know, with uh, regard of uh, uh, how, um, how useful or how not very useful uh, ChatGPT can be for the students, you know, so in this sense, and also in my personal experience, I would echo, you know, uh, the conclusion of Nassim Nicolas Taleb, you know, so really, you know, uh, and uh, this uh, really reflects my experience. Uh, so really for me is, uh, is the case so that you have um, a lot of knowledge about a particular topic, you know, so that way you can actually correct, you know, ChatGPT, for example, you know, for its uh, hallucinations, you know, not very good results, uh, uh, you know, in the sense of output, etc. But then, if you uh, if you are a newcomer to the field and you try to ask uh, ChatGPT in order to learn, you know that is uh, that is actually you know it is not going to deliver really great results. And finally, and with this, I conclude. Uh, you know. Uh, actually, you know, when I uh, when I first uh, got started, you know, in the field of artificial intelligence, you know, I was actually a little bit uh, sad and perhaps a little bit over dramatic, you know, because I thought that, you know, like with uh, ChatGPT, you know, everything was already discovered. But I think that, uh, you know, within especially data-driven approaches, you know, because they tend to focus so much on uh, optimization as opposite, for example, to other concepts uh, such as, for example, the concept of satisfying, you know, which was mm -hmm. introduced by Herbert. Simon, you know, which is just reaching, you know, the just right level, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, this is something that uh, is not done, you know, uh, within data-driven approaches because they are so focused on uh, on uh, on uh, delivering uh, the optimal, on uh, maximizing in economic terms, you know, the expected utility, uh, you know. So in this sense, uh, uh, for example, you know, I can put you the example of a child, for example, right? So uh, in the case of a child, and actually Alan Turing also posed this question in 1950, you know that, uh, for example, why instead of trying to understand uh, 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 the functioning of the human mind, why we don't understand better the functioning of, uh, 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 you know, the human, stru uh, the cognitive structure of a child, you know, because in this sense, for example, we can never be exactly sure, you know, for example, when a child, for example, starts to speak or starts to write, and this, for example, you know, can be very curious for ChatGPT because, for example, for some particular uh, complicated question. For example, uh, personally, I would rather prefer many times, you know, uh, to wait for, say, uh, 14 uh, minutes or 27 minutes, you know, and uh, uh, to, to get just uh, the perfect answer, you know, instead of this, uh, you know, optimization approach, you know, that I described previously. So, sorry for having been uh, no, a little okay. bit long, you know, so thank okay. you very much. Thank okay. you again. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, there, so, there was a lot packed into that question. I'll try to pick a couple of uh, pieces out and answer them. So first of all, I think everybody was just stunned when ChatGPT came out. I, at least I was, and everybody I know was. Um, you know, it, it just, it seemed like magic. And even today, it still does. Um, so it was, it was stunning. 
Um, there are a couple of things that I would point out about it. I, th I think it's a great tool. Um, Aristotle, in the, in the ethics, talks about the need to develop virtue at a young age, right? So he says, you know, if you've got society, you've got this sort of maturing process, but if you're still lacking any virtue when you're 30, um, you know, it's pretty, gonna be pretty hopeless for you because you're really picking up those skills and habits, especially the habits of learning, judging, getting your desires aligned with what, in the way that they should be. These are happening when you're young. The worry about ChatGPT, and we're all human, is that instead of going through the hard work of learning, we use ChatGPT as a shortcut. So I know, for example, colleagues who teach online classes that, um, that the students were actually, because they got credit, so what do, you, you know, what do you get credit for is a very important question to a student. So the professor would take a snapshot of the chat at the end and give credit for people participating in the chat, it was an online class. And students were copying other students' <laughs> comments into chat GPT to generate the chat comments <laughs> that they would enter into, into uh, their, their chat uh, box. So, you know, if you're in a world where you're not being, you're not learning the hard work of how to think, and I do think part of the hard work of learning how to think is failure. I, I think failure is really unpleasant, but it's such an important part of, of sort of correcting um, bad thinking skills. So I worry that ChatGPT and what's coming, because it will only get better, right? This, what you see now in ChatGPT is the worst version of ChatGPT that we'll ever have, right? So this is the worst. It's only gonna get better um, and do a better job. So, so the first thing is it was surprising. The second thing is, is that it is, a, um, it is a concern that it will be used as a shortcut during formative years when people need to be doing the hard work of learning how to think and learning how to develop their virtues. The other thing that a lot of people I think haven't thought about yet, and I'll, I'll share that with you because it's something that, that also occurred to me, the amazing nature of ChatGPT, now again, this is just pattern recognition. This is literally predicting the next word in a sentence. ChatGPT is not having an inner life. It's not thinking about the conversation. It's not thinking in terms of sentences and whole thoughts and trying to look down at you know, uh, the points that it's going to make about what you're saying. That shows you, the fact that it does so well shows you the power of pattern recognition. And one of the things that I think is interesting is that Animals, sentient animals do pattern recognition. And so there have been a lot of excitement about gorillas holding up a, some, a card that says, you know, that has a banana on it or a card, you know, with a heart on it or something like this. And people, oh, you know, the, the gorillas are learning language. And um, this development seems to really undermine a lot of that work, right? <laughs> because, it, because if animals can do pattern recognition, it actually means they can do a lot that maybe we didn't think they could do just based on pattern recognition. So even without the ability to have abstract concepts like the good, maybe even without having um, the ability to have free will, maybe just operating like chat, they can come across as being remarkably human. So, um, so I think we need to revisit a lot of that work and uh, how we're gonna test that is very hard to say because we have these inner lives. Remember, your inner life is data. It's data that is only accessible to you, but it is data, right? And we should treat it as data. That's what it is. You're experiencing things. Those are data points to you. I can't have those data points, right? There's something going on inside of you that I can't have. And I think that makes this business about testing whether or not computers ultimately have human-like intelligence is going to be very difficult to assess. But I do think at some point they'll pass all the tests and even surpass all the tests. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yes. But then, you know, actually, you know, what we don't realize is that uh, sometimes, you know, as we just said, you know, 
That's, yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Well, that, that's a great point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Uh, you covered many interesting topics, and I mean, I, mean, I know you, the, most of your talk was on the possible biases and manipulation. I actually noticed that you mentioned that you organized a conference on how AI can go from correlation to causation, Yes. right? And that is one of the topics that actually interests me the most. So I wonder if you could expand more on that. I'll, be, I'll do that very briefly, and if you'd like, I, I can point you in the direction of work in that area. Um, uh, Udaya Pearl is a, uh, is a computer scientist. He's been around for a long time. And he's famous for having developed a mathematical approach to um, thinking about causation. And uh, the reason that he was interested in this, and this goes back to the 80s. So he started his work in the 80s. Um, and he was developing um, mathematics of uh, data generating systems. So if we believe there's causation in the world and the world generates data as a result, What's the underlying mathematical structure? And so he developed that. It's called, mostly referred to as structural causal modeling. So if you Google that, you'll get a lot of work in that area. And so he developed that independently. And then most recently, there's been an interest in intersecting that with machine learning so that we start to try and get arrows on the correlations. Yeah, and I'm more than happy. I've you know, got lots and lots of stuff I can point you toward. Professor, for your presentation. Um, I have a question, more philosophical, maybe. Okay. <laughs> um, like humans, we have many, many pro ethical problems. And um, one of the most popular, it maybe, is the bias. But now we are not alone. We have bias with the humans, but we have the problem, ethical problem, with the A and I. So. In your case, you say, okay, we have a very sophisticated parent of recognition. So do you think the A and I, it could, could be a solve this problem about uh, bias, or maybe it's a very huge problem at the future? My own belief is that, in principle, there's no reason that AI can't be, um, so, so there's, you know, there's the problem of bias. The, in the context of this talk, the problem of bias is that it's leading you to not have wisdom, right? That's the problem. And so in order to have wisdom, you need, I think, to have a very broad exposure to things, and in particular, counterfactual things, things that you don't believe could be true. In principle, there's no reason that AI can't help us with that. In fact, AI should be great at that. Um, I would love to, um, you know, get a bunch of computer scientists together to develop an app. You know, we have all these exercise apps and diet apps and all of this stuff. You know, why do we not have an app where the learning is to help people develop wisdom, prudence, temperance, courage, right? In principle, there's no reason that we can't have uh, tools that help us in that direction. And AI seems like it would be fantastic for that. Um, I think my point is, is that at the moment, that's not how it's being used. D does that answer your question? You know, I mean, I'm very excited. About, I'm actually optimistic. I'm very excited about the possibility. And I think part of my point about the democratization is that we may actually see some of these things. You know, Google may decide that it wants people to think a certain way and be behave a certain way. But others who care about human flourishing may develop tools that help us go in that direction. And then I think we're, you know, we're in a much better place. Yeah. If I can myself pose a question. Oh, okay. It's uh, rather philosophical too. Um, you, you said that um, our superpower is the ability to conceptualize, to build uh, abstract concepts. <clears throat> and, and this, for me, this is interesting because um, t taking the, the example of circularity, what is circularity in contrast to the image of a circle? 
as, uh, the concept of circularity is not an image. It's something different. Um, but some people could react in, in a sense that uh, this is suspicious to be connected with the soul. And I don't want to know anything about the soul. So uh, I want to uh, find another connection. OK. Then I, I offer a partial solution. And this partial solution is words. Instead of using an image, use a word, which the, uh, the word circle or circularity does not resemble a circle, any circle. This is a nominalistic approach, taking back to medieval philosophy. But the point is, and, and I think this is a very important point, that the, the, the connection between uh, circles in the world and uh, images of circle in the mind or in a neural network, that connection is more or less physical. It's uh, uh, done by means of a physical process. But the, the connection between um, a, a word and its meaning is not physical. And that's the core of the, the, the science of sins of semiotics. And that is very interesting because you don't need to appeal to the soul or the spirit or something like that, only to the meaning of words. And that, I think that's at the root of the problem that ChatGPT has uh, of connecting words with the uh, world, which it, in fact, can't. ChatGPT is very good at connecting words with words, but not connecting words with the world. And that is because it is not able of uh, that process of uh, semiosis, signification. So I, I think this, uh, it's a, a very interesting point that uh, is uh, in, in your presentation, uh, that, that superpower of working of abstract concepts or simply, I would say, we uh, can use a simpler version, the superpower of uh, semiosis. And that's enough, I think. Well, okay, so that's, so it sounds like we're mostly in agreement. Um, so you notice I did not appeal to a soul or duality or anything like that. Um, whatever your religious beliefs or lack of religious beliefs are, you know, are not, part of the argument, but, um, but there are arguments that I think would take longer than we have to talk about here that suggest that concepts, um, that, that these concepts are not, are just in principle not storable in physical matter. And so if that's true, and I think we, we can have a discussion about that, if that's true, it means that your brain is not the sum total of your mind. Um, now, a word is a token. So to me, this amazing superpower that we have for conceptualization, one of the primary um, benefits is that we can develop tokens for concepts. So a concept is something that I, ha you said meaning, the word meaning. There's something that has meaning to me. Good, love, but money. Money is a concept, right? I, and, and because I'm human, we can print, uh, in, in my case, a dollar bill, which is a piece of paper with some ink on it, that is just a piece of paper with some ink on it, and yet I grasp that this is a medium of exchange, which is an abstract concept. And I understand that, you know, if someone puts the gavel down, the meeting's over. Right? I, I, these things have meaning to me that are not inherent in the physical thing. I assign the concept, I can assign concepts to physical things, and I can assign concepts to words. The word circularity, I grasp as, me, as the meaning circularity. <laughs> the concept of circularity is what I can apply to anything that has a circular shape. So any instance of a circle, I can identify as having circularity. So yeah. that's... Or having a connection. I don't know, that, I don't know how close that aligns with no, your... No, I, I think... Uh, our visions are very, very close because what you call a concept is what I call the meaning of, a, not the word, which is a yes. token yes. and can be physically represented, but the meaning yes. is, is not f uh, something physical. Uh, we've got, uh, if, if you allow us to uh, have uh, some more minutes because we have um, a question here in the, in the chat 
Um, how could developer bias be detached from the bias their AI develop? Do you believe there are ways as a society to prevent the government or corporations from controlling these tools? So that's, that's two questions. So one question is, is there really at the end of the day, because we all have biases, is there really any way that your bias doesn't get worked into your code? Um, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the superficial answer would, you know, the immediate answer is, well, no, that must be the case that your, if you're a coder, that your bias will, even if you're trying, uh, will get into the code. Um, I'm much more concerned, just to be clear, about intentionally building bias into your code uh, than unintentional bias. So I think intentional bias is a much more dangerous thing than unintentional bias. But unintentional bias can happen as well. In answer to the question, is it possible that AI can be used to clean developers' biases? Remember, developers are now using AI to help write code. Is there a way that AI can check code and, and identify sort of red flag things that seem like they might be biased? I don't know. You know, that's an interesting question. That's for someone in computer science to answer. In terms of stopping the government, I think this is a very real um, concern. Uh, and it isn't just the government, it's just people with power. As I said before, people with power want to keep their power. And now they have these amazing tools. You know, you look at the Chinese Communist Party putting everyone on a social credit scoring system. And that is oppression like you have never seen oppression before. That is, that is man. You know, that is controlling you in a very immediate and detailed way. But I, I meant to end, you know, the, the last slide that I presented, the last couple of slides were intended to be an answer to that question, which is can we develop the tools to block the bad tools, right? So if it requires the Department of Defense level spending to write AI, then the answer is I think we're all in a, in a very bad place because we don't have the resources of the Defense Department. Um, but if it turns out that Mike Ryle can be a Python programmer in five minutes, well, maybe Mike Ryle soon will be able to develop tools that sort of block the bad influences and help me develop the good influences. Okay. Any other question? So thank you very, very much, uh, Mike, and thank you everybody here Thank in you. the room and also online. Thank you.